Delivering this week's must-watch workplace storylines, this is Bloomberg Law's Punching In for those of you listening in Washington and across the globe. Hey, everyone. Thanks for punching in with us. We'll kick off today's episode by catching up with a big story from late last week that sort of spilled over, if you will, into the labor space because of the involvement of one in particular senior administration official. That's Labor Secretary Alex Acosta. Acosta, who used to be the U.S. attorney for the city of Miami, was responsible for the prosecution of Jeffrey Epstein during his time there. Epstein is a Florida multimillionaire. The, the Miami Herald released a blockbuster investigation late last week where they identified about 80 women who say they were molested or otherwise sexually abused. Most of these women are or or were minors by Epstein. And and fundamentally, the story here is is bringing to light new details about about not only Epstein's behavior and Acosta's involvement, but also how his money sort of helped him evade what would be an actual prosecution for most people accused of of crimes of this sort. So I have Jacqueline Diaz, who covers the Department of Labor here with us to catch us up on the story. Hey, Jacqueline, how are you? Hey, how are you? I'm doing well. This this issue actually came up during Acosta's confirmation. Uh, So tell us a bit about how, how that played over and how that was handled in the past. Yeah, so this definitely wasn't new news to some extent. The Miami Herald definitely brought to light some more details on Acosta's involvement in a deal made between Epstein and his attorneys to get a deal that allowed Epstein to avoid federal prison time. But Mm -hmm. when Acosta was being confirmed or going through the confirmation process for the labor secretary, the fact that he was involved in this case did come up. Right. And so I guess guess what's different now is is not only that that they dug in and, and uncovered some new facts, but also that you know, we're much further along with the Me Too movement. The story, for, for different reasons, went viral, was, was retweeted and, and, and talked about by, by pretty prominent people. Uh, so tell us, what are folks saying, especially lawmakers, of course, what are folks saying about how what this means for, for Acosta's uh, current post, I should say? We're hearing a lot from Democrats on this. Some have pointed out that they voted against Acosta's uh, confirmation for Liberty Secretary because of, of mm-hmm. his involvement in this case before right. this story came out. But uh, Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz said she actually wants an investigation of corruption into Acosta because of this story. Right. And uh, Virginia Senator Tim Kaine sa- said he'll be watching the civil lawsuits that are pending in South Florida right now that are coming from uh, Epstein's victims going forward. Got it. And so I know you reported also in the past about some whispers we heard about uh, about Acosta's sort of aspirations. Uh, one was that he was angling for a judgeship, maybe, and there's even been talk that he might want to be a U.S. Attorney General, Jeff Sessions' old job. So has anyone commented, or, or what are people saying about his prospects, uh, and how, about how this might affect him, if, if those are his aspirations? I've been talking to a, a lot of people this week on uh, whether they think it will affect him now as in his uh, current role as Labor Secretary, or what it looks like for him for the future. And in terms of the AG spot, there have already been reports that he's out of the running for that, although a lot of people have noted that he wasn't likely to take that position anyway. But he has uh, had some goals to become a judge, which we've talked a lot about, but that actually might uh, be in some trouble now, given the stain this story has caused. Right, and as as I said, the the story, uh, for whatever reason, this time drew a lot more attention than it did when he was going through his confirmation, so certainly uh, folks might remember that 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 was the U.S. attorney connected to that, you know, pretty awful case that that we all read about. uh, uh, over the last week. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we'll definitely keep up on that and see how it affects the Costa going forward. Thank you for joining us, Jacqueline. Thanks. Our next item today takes us to Congress, where there'll be a hearing this week on the implications, the consequences of raising the federal minimum wage to $15. And that hearing will be on Wednesday by the Ed- Education and Workforce Committee in the House there. The current federal minimum wage is at $7.25. $7.25. It's, of course, higher in, in, in a number of states who've taken the initiative to raise their own wages uh, past the federal floor. But again, the country hasn't raised the federal minimum wage in about a decade by now. Of course, what's interesting here is that the House has flipped. We've talked about that plenty on this podcast. The Democrats have a large majority there. And in fact, Bobby Scott of Virginia has told some of my colleagues that that the Democrats plan to make this issue, raising the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour, a a priority uh, in the new Congress. And the approach here, the strategy is they'll be coloring this as as a bipartisan issue, right? Citing different states, red states like Arkansas and Missouri and others who have raised their their, their minimum past $7.25 to sort of argue that both liberal 
liberal and conservative constituents uh, agree that number should be a bit higher. And of course, this is one of those questions where when you separate the question away from either party or any, any particular politicians and just ask folks, do you think the, do you favor raising the minimum wage? Uh, folks tend to agree with that. It, it, in 2016, a Pew poll showed that uh, 58% of Americans supported raising the federal minimum wage to $15. So essentially, the, the reason why you want to pay attention to this particular hearing here is that it'll be a, it'll be a preview, right, of, of a debate that will continue months into to 2019 when Democrats have control of the House and are making their big push to actually get this done. And we'll see how, how they'll be arguing for that and, and how Republicans will be reacting. So as, as I said, that'll be again on Wednesday. In our last item today, we're seeing some indication of movement on various Trump administration labor nominees. But maybe more importantly, Senator Patty Murray came out late last week and essentially said that Democrats on the Senate labor panels would be holding up uh, those nominees, including Cheryl Stanton, who's been picked to head the wage and hour department and others, uh, that they'd be holding up those folks unless two Democrat appointees to labor agencies uh, get moving. And that's uh, Kai Feldblum, who's been appointed to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and Mark Pierce, uh, appointed to the labor board. Both of those picks are quite strongly opposed by, by the business lobby and, and lots of conservative politicians. So we'll have a bit more on, on who the Democrats are planning to block and, and, and how the Republicans will respond in the column. All right, that's it for this week, folks. Thanks for punching in with us for the Labor Desk's Monday morning musings. For more coverage, be sure to check out our website where the Punching In column is hosted. That's news.bloomberglaw.com. And of course, you can always follow me on Twitter at Hassan Kanu. See you next week.